So today, 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 can you hear me? Hello? Hello? I'm on. Can you hear me? You can hear me out there? Okay. We'll pretend like that didn't happen. So today is my birthday, and when I was thinking about my birthday, I started to think about the most valuable gift that I'd ever received. And when you start to think about the most valuable gifts that you've ever received, you kind of try to figure out what you mean by valuable and, wh and what that exactly means. Am I thinking monetary? Am I thinking the most valuable gift that means something in my heart? And one of the things that I thought about was this guitar that I was playing this morning. This guitar was given to me by my grandfather about 14 years ago. He knew that I needed something new to play, and he bought me this guitar. And then I started thinking about maybe the most valuable gift that I had been given was the one that Jennifer had given me yesterday, right there. Give somebody a second to figure that out. So Jennifer was trying to make sure that she might be able to win next year on Mother's Day for the most kids, so we just figured we'd have another one. It's taking a second, I think. <laughs> this is new. <laughs> Amen. So we're done. I'm getting there. Hold on. So, so we're done. Yes, we're done. I've already set up those appointments, and it'll be great. <laughs> but we're really excited for those of you that didn't know, we lost a baby in December on uh, Jennifer's birthday, and this little girl is due on Christmas Eve, and we are thoroughly excited. And I'm not going to cry. But some of those are the most valuable gifts that you've ever received. And I started talking to Jennifer. I was like, well, Jennifer, what are your most valuable gifts that you've ever received and she said well probably my my rings she's got a ring from her mother that's passed away that her mother always wore she's got the rings that I've given her and for some of you women you might think those are the most valuable gifts that you've been given I thought about teenagers and I thought well maybe a teenager might say that their most valuable gift is their first car or their first cell phone or something like that but if we were to talk to Paul what Paul would tell us is that our most valuable gift is our faith. Our most valuable gift is our salvation. Our most valuable gift is the thing that we've been given from God that we hold inside of us. And we've been looking at these verses in 2 Timothy. And I'm going to read to you from chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And it says this, Who has saved us and called us into a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality and light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. When you heard for what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And this morning, I just want to share three connections that Paul is making in this, in this scripture. If you're a note taker, then you're doing really good. How many of you are note takers? None of you, probably. Note takers, yes. Everyone knows that if you take notes, you're going to the front of the line in heaven. It's, it's in the Bible somewhere. I promise you'll be able to find it, maybe. 
I'm surprised that more of our teachers don't take notes when you make your students take notes. I'm just saying. But this morning, I just want to share with you three connections that Paul makes. And the first connection, the connection that he's going to make is he's going to make this connection between vulnerability and value. He's going to make the connection between vulnerability and value. Because what he's talking about here is he says, guard the good deposit. Guard the good deposit. And that word deposit means the same thing that it would mean today. It's something that you would entrust to another person. That could be your time. That could be your money. It could be another person that you entrust to someone else. But he's saying, guard the good deposit. And it's almost as if he's sounding an alarm. Paul's saying, hey, Timothy, the thing that you have, it's under attack. The thing that you've been given from God, it's under attack, and you have to guard it. Because people don't guard things that have no value. You wouldn't guard something that was just junk. Some of you, you have vehicles that you leave unlocked with the keys in the seat, hoping that someone will take it. But we don't guard something that is not valuable. And what we start to see here is there's value in this thing that Paul's talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. And for some of you, you probably feel like the devil is extra tough on you. Like you are under constant attack. And what we tend to think when that happens is that means that we have no value. So what the enemy would want us to believe is that when we're con con under constant attack is that we have no value. That we amount to nothing. And what Paul is telling us is the exact opposite is the truth. That vulnerability shows our value. Thieves would never rob an empty house. It wouldn't make much sense. So the truth is, is if your house is under attack, maybe that means that you have something of value that the enemy wants. Much in the same way, if you were to look at the UK football team, the defenders would never tackle somebody without the ball, most of the time. So if you feel like you've just been leveled, maybe it's because you have the ball. Maybe it's because you've been doing something important for the kingdom and you're going down a path that God has called you to and the enemy doesn't like what you're doing. But the enemy has us believe the exact opposite is true. And the truth is, I believe that sometimes that's why we struggle so often for some of us with negative thinking. You think you don't amount to much. You think that you could never do any more than you can, you're doing right now. You think that the thing that God has called you to, you could never get there. And the reason that you struggle with that is because the enemy puts these, these thoughts into your head. Because if you could ever get around that way of thinking, if you could ever get around these negative thoughts, he knows that you could do damage to his kingdom like has never been done before. And for some of us, I believe that that's why we're sad sometimes and we just don't even understand why. Like you just wake up and you realize, hey man, I'm in a funk. I don't know how I'm ever going to get out of it. And people say, well, what's wrong? And you say, I just don't know. Because what the enemy has learned is he's learned that if he can keep you sad, if he can keep you from thinking that you can accomplish a goal, then he can keep you away from what God has called you to. So some of us struggle with that depression out of nowhere. Because the enemy knows that if you ever got happy, that you would do so much damage that he wouldn't even know what to do with himself. And for some of you, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to reassess your calling. You need to reassess your calling because what you've realized is you started to believe that your struggle 
equals weakness. You started to believe that, that when you struggle that it means that you're weak. And what I think Paul wants you to realize is that if you're struggling, that means that you have value. That there is something, <coughs> excuse me, that God wants for you. And for some of you, you have a, a skill or an ability or something that God has given you, and you start to think about that thing, and you say, you know what? God can never use me for that. Like, I can't play good enough. I can't sing well enough. It's just not good enough. So I can't use it. And you start to think that, well, if I'm thinking that way about myself, if I have that doubt, that what that means is that God can't use me. What I want you to realize is just the fact that you have that doubt shows that you have value. And for some of you, I believe that God has said, hey, you need to go play with that worship team. And you say, well, I'm not good enough. I can't sing well enough. I can't play well enough. What I want you to realize is those doubts are from the enemy. The gifts that God has given you, you can use for his kingdom. You have value. <coughs> so when your life, when your house when your family is under attack, you have to guard the good deposit that God has given you. So the first connection was between vulnerability and value. And the second connection that I want to talk to you about this morning is the connection between circumstance and confidence. The connection between circumstance and confidence. Because I used to believe that everything bad came from the devil, and everything good came from God. That's just what we teach. But the truth is, is that the enemy, he will attack your circumstances to get to your confidence. The enemy will attack your circumstances to get to your confidence. And let me just give you an example. When someone steals your wallet... They are not stealing your wallet because they like your wallet. Well, they might be for some of you. I don't know. But for a majority of us, if someone is stealing your wallet, it's because they want what is inside your wallet. They want your credit cards. They want your money. They want all of that stuff. They could care less about your wallet. And the same is true when it comes to circumstance and confidence. The enemy gets at our circumstances because he believes that if he can get at our circumstances, he can destroy our confidence. He says, I know what I'll do. They really believe in God, and they, they believe that God can change things, and they believe that God can do good works in their life. Well, let's see how they feel when their job falls apart. Let's see how they feel when their kids don't obey a single word that they say. Let's see how they feel when their circumstances start to run out. Are they still going to have the same confidence in God? And what you need to realize is that the enemy doesn't win when he gets at your circumstances. When he destroys all of the circumstances in your life, the enemy hasn't won. Unless you begin to doubt God. And then he's done exactly what he set out to do. And here's the thing. Did you realize that when you sin, it doesn't change your relationship with God? It doesn't change your relationship with God because if it did, that would mean that we are holding on to him. And from what I read in the Bible, God has saved us. He reached out and held on to me. But what happens when we begin to sin is it destroys our confidence in the relationship that we have with God. <coughs> we start to doubt whether or not he still loves us. We start to doubt whether or not he still saved us. And it gets us in this place where we start to doubt God altogether. We start to doubt whether in the times when we're in struggle, 
that we can do what the Bible tells us and we can approach the throne boldly. But we've sinned. God won't be there for me. And we start to lack that confidence. Let me ask you this. How many of you, by a show of hands maybe, would say that you're a confident person? A few of you. And and some of you might say, well, you know, it kind of depends on the circumstance, right? Like, while I'm standing here, I feel pretty good. I feel pretty confident. I believe in what God has called me to say. I believe in the message that God has given me. I rarely feel adequate, but I am a confident person. However, if you throw me into a pool of water, I become much less confident. I can stay alive for a little while, but I float like a bag of rocks. I just don't. So when you throw me in the water, it scares the death out of me. And what you realize is there are some places in your life when you are extremely confident. There are things that you are good at and you know that you are good at. You know that you do well. And there are times when you were just like, man, I can't do this. And you lack confidence. And what you realize is that confidence and circumstance are directly related. And how amazing would it be for us to realize that our confidence in God wasn't circumstantial? How much more amazing would our lives be if we could realize that our confidence in God did not rely on our circumstances. That we could believe in God that he would be able to pull us through no matter what's going on in our lives. How much more could you do for the kingdom? How much more could you do for the people in your lives if you realized that no matter what is going on, God is still in control. That's the connection that Paul is showing us here. He's saying, hey, Timothy, don't worry about it. We've got this. I can be confident in God. And here's the thing. If we start thinking that we can just have confidence in God, it might make us a little bit cocky. Let's look at what he said in verse 12. He said, that is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed. Because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him to that day. And then if you read verse 14, it says, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So what Paul is saying is, hey, hey man, you can do it. You can have confidence, but you have to do it with the Holy Spirit. You can't do it alone. So the first connection was this connection between value and vulnerability. And the second was the connection between circumstance and confidence. And the last one that I want to talk to you about this morning is the connection between trusting and being entrusted. The connection between trusting and being entrusted. Because most of you, let's do this, how many of you believe that you can trust God? This should be really easy. Right? We all believe that we can trust God. But how, let me ask this question. How many of you believe that God has entrusted you? It's not as many of us. But this is exactly what Paul tells us. Paul is saying that God has entrusted you to do the work. God has entrusted this gift to you. He's given it to you and he's entrusted you to do it. So let me think about this for a moment. When Peter walked on the water... And he's out there and Jesus calls him to come. And he's walking on the water and all of a sudden he starts to doubt. He starts to quit trusting. But he's not doubting Jesus. Because Peter's looking at Jesus and Jesus is doing pretty good standing there on the water. And he's not sinking. What what Peter starts to doubt, what Peter starts to not trust in is himself. He's looking at Jesus, and Jesus is calm, and he's standing there cool and collected. But Peter starts to doubt himself. 
He's like, I'm not able to do this. I mean, for a moment he was brave and he knew that he could. And he steps out and all of a sudden this doubt starts to creep in. And Paul's writing Timothy and he's like, Timothy, man, don't worry about what's going on. Don't worry about the situation that you see me in. Don't, don't worry about this time that I'm in jail. Don't worry about everything else that you've seen happen. Don't worry about that. Because I still believe, no matter whether I'm here, no matter whether I'm out there, that I can still do the work that God has entrusted me to. He's saying you have to have faith, you have to believe. But we know that Timothy struggled with timidity. Just a few verses earlier, in verse 3 through 5, he says, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as a knight and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives also in you. He's saying, man, I know that it started there. Hey, Timothy, I know you have faith, brother. I know that you believe that God can do it. Timothy, I know that. We've worked together. We started churches together. We went on these journeys together. In fact, Timothy is running the church in Ephesus that Paul started. And he's saying, listen, Timothy, I realize that you believe that God has the power, but that's not enough. You also have to believe <coughs> that you can do what he's called you to through the Holy Spirit. You have to believe in yourself through him. And that's where we miss the buck so many times. As we forget that God has entrusted us with a work to do. So we've always heard that, that you should trust God. But rarely do we hear that God has entrusted us with a work to do. And Paul's saying, I believe that he can complete this work that he's entrusted me to do. I believe he's put me in the right spot. I believe he's put me exactly where I need to be to do the work that he's entrusted me to. As a matter of fact, I believe personally that, that I can raise my kids that God has entrusted to me. Not by my own power, but through the power of his Holy Spirit. Some of you should believe the same thing. No matter how crazy your kids get, no matter how out of control they seem, you should believe that he is able to complete the work that God has given you. The children that he has entrusted you to, you should believe that he, through his spirit, you can get them to where they need to be. And the same goes for some of our jobs. You need to realize that he can do the work that he has called you to. You can complete the mission that God has called you to in the exact place he has put you. Some of us don't hold on to that. We get to this place, I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to be able to be a lighthouse for him. I'm never going to be able to, to show people about God where I am. And Paul says, you have to believe that you can complete the work that has been entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit. If the worship team would come this morning, one of the last things I want you to know is this. Sometimes we look at our circumstances in our lives and we are so frustrated. And I get that because some of our circumstances are out of control. And we get to this place in our lives and our circumstances start swirling around us. And we feel like we're going down the drain and we don't know what to do anymore. And the thing that we try to do, the thing that we've been taught is that we have to fix it. What if I were to tell you that sometimes it's not your job to fix your circumstances? What if I were to tell you that sometimes when your circumstances are swirling, the one thing that God wants you to do more than anything else is to make sure that your confidence does not fail. And keep moving forward 
in the work that he has entrusted to you. This morning, I want you to guard the good deposit. Don't allow those things that are coming at you in your life to take you off, to let you think that what you have is not of value. Because your salvation, your faith, everything that God has poured into your life is the most valuable thing that you have ever been given. Will you stand with me? Here in a moment, the worship team is going to begin to play, and we're going to give you, give you time. If you're here this morning, and you have never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, we want to give you the opportunity this morning to come forward and to accept Him as that this morning, and then you can be baptized here today. And for some of you, you might be going through difficult situations in your life, and you just need somebody to pray with you. We have our prayer team over here, and they would be glad to pray with you while the band is playing. Well, for whatever that need may be. So let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessings that you give us, Lord, and we are so grateful that you still speak to us in our lives. Jesus, this morning, we just pray that you would help us to guard the good deposit that you've given us. And Father, if there are people here that have never received that deposit, Lord, we just ask that you'd give them the strength that it takes to step out of their seat and come forward so that you can put that deposit in their lives. Lord, this morning, we just love you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.